our prayer book. It's not our prayer request book, but it's a list, a uh, book packed full of names uh, for many reasons. Only God knows the reasons why they're in here. So if we would, we'll go to the uh, Lord in prayer so that we lift this book up. Lord, we come to you today. We lift this book up in prayer, Lord. We continue to pray for all the names several times a week. We ask, Lord, that you'd reach out and touch every one of these people in here, uh, that they would use their answered prayers, Lord, to glorify you. Lord, we ask that you would be with Pastor Woody as he delivers the message today, uh, that it would sink in our hearts and make it dance as we leave here, Lord. We continue to pray for our loved ones and our family and for our spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, brother. God bless you all. Thank you for being here. You're good. You're good. Don't worry. It's all, you did good. <laughs> all prayer is good, right? That's right. Prayer is just talking to God, and all prayer is good. Uh, i got to get to my notes. I didn't flip my pages right. Anyway, we'll get to our teaching here in just a second. Uh, welcome, everybody. Glad you're here. Happy Jesus' birthday. Yeah, that's what I like to tell people. I don't like to say, happy holidays. Well, Merry Christmas, I like that too. You know what Christmas means? More Christ, right? Christmas, right? More Christ. Well, Merry Christmas and happy Jesus' birthday to all of y'all. And uh, looking forward to uh, uh, our next three weeks. We're going to do the Christmas message. I'll do it this week. Chris will do it next week. And then uh, I'll follow up with the birth of Christ on uh uh, on the 25th, but uh, anyway, glad you all made it, and I know Christmas Day, Christmas falls on Chris. I mean, uh, falls on Sunday this year, and so everybody's saying, well, am I going to go to church, am I not going to go to church, you know, Christmas Day, that's my day off, you know, hey, it is the day to be with the Lord, right, is it not? I mean, it is the day of the Lord, our, the first day of the week, Sunday, that's the day of the Lord. I mean, that's the day that we meet, the reason we meet. We celebrate his resurrection that day. So let's celebrate his birth that day. So please try to be here if you can. Uh, I understand people travel, etc., but encourage others to be here as well. Uh, I notice your sidekick is not here. Is, uh, Tammy, is he okay? Is, Okay, well, we need to lift up Billy for sure. He didn't have the steak dinner the other night. He didn't look like he was feeling real great then. But, yeah, so anyway, let's lift up Billy. Glad you're here. Uh, but anyway, we're going to get started with our teaching here in just a second. Uh, we're going to dismiss for the uh, children's church, then we'll get started. Uh, there's not a scripture up there. And the reason there's not a scripture up there is because we're going to talk about a bunch of scripture. In the Old Testament... And I didn't feel it would be fair, I guess you would say, to be saying, okay, I'll wait till you find the, uh, the book of Amos. Amos? You mean Amos and Andy? Now, some of y'all remember that, and some of you are going, what? Okay, but there is a book called Amos. No, there's not one called Andy. <clears throat> but that is Christ's first name. Andy walked with me, and he talked with me. Okay? All right. <clears throat> so anyway. So anyway, uh, uh, we're going to do a lot in the Old Testament because what I'm going to teach you on today is the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah, the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. I'm going to use New Testament, <clears throat> I'm going to use Old Testament, I'm going to talk a little bit about Isaiah, a little bit about Genesis, and on and on and on and on and on. Because what I'm trying to do is to get you to realize, I guess, or, or to understand how the Jews felt. Okay, everybody's going to be getting uh, gifts. Most of everybody will be getting gifts this uh, 25th uh, Christmas Day. And the anticipation of that is like, oh, wow, you know, what am I going to get? What am I going to get? Uh, Ford F-350 du Dually double cab, that would be fine. Okay, all right. Make sure it's a Ford. I don't want to push the Chevy. Uh, but anyway, um, you know, we're going to have anticipation of, of things happening. Really and truly, our anticipation is, and this is something that we're having to deal with, um, is our kids coming down because we want them all to come down, but we don't want to come down on there, you know, and, and so we're talking about maybe doing it on the week before uh, 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 the next week, the following weekend. Well, that's New Year's, and oh, well, we don't want to come down and do that on New Year's. You know how kids are. 
So anyway, uh, we're going to work all that. But our gift is to have all of our kids together. I mean, we look forward to that. We, I mean, we do the gift thing and all that stuff too. But, but we love to have all of our kids together. And it's very, very rarely that we get that gift. So we, we look forward to it. <clears throat> the Jews look forward to a gift. The coming of the Messiah, the Savior of Israel, Jesus, Savior, God's Savior, that he sent for all of Israel to be saved. But they didn't get the gift that they thought they, the gift that they, thought they were going to get. What they got was a, a baby. What? A baby? We don't want a baby. We want a warrior king. We want somebody who's going to defeat everybody because God, after all, that's what you promised. And we're going to look at that today. So you see, sometimes we don't get the things that we want. It's because we have our minds on the wrong thing. And so this season, I pray and I hope that you'll understand. The reason for the season is Jesus. That's the only reason. Now we know, we know he wasn't born December the 25th. We know that. And that's okay. But that's when our nation chooses to celebrate his birth. That's all that it is. We're not trying to, to say, oh, yes, by God, the Bible says Jesus was born December the 25th, 2004. I mean, uh, in the year four. Okay? We know he wasn't. But we know he was born. And that's what we celebrate. Not when, but that he was. That's what Christmas is about. And the Jews anticipated this great gift of God coming to them. And when they opened the present, it wasn't what they thought. How many times have your kids opened up the present and go, well, this is not really what I thought I was going to get. A pair of socks? What I want socks for? Well, to keep your feet warm. Anyway, so we're going to share with you in the next three weeks the coming of the Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament, the coming of the Messiah prophesied in the New Testament, and because the Old, New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, the New Testament, or the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, right? Okay, so it's all there. So throughout the whole Bible. And then, of course, on the uh, Sunday the 25th, we're going to uh, discuss the birth of our Lord and Savior, all right? So that's how it's going to be kind of laid out. So just please join us all three weeks for that. And don't forget about our candlelight service on uh, at 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, right? I just want to make sure that I was right. 6 o'clock on Christmas Eve, all right? We have a good time. It'll last about 30, 40 minutes, but it's a, it's a special time. So please join us for that. Uh, we're going to pray up our kids. We got two. Yes, sir. Okay, well, what about number 11? We don't. Yeah, we do. <laughs> no, okay, you and Ryan. All right, so let's, let's, pray, let's pray up our kids in our children's church, and we'll get started today. We have a lot of Scripture to go through. Just write them down, and you can refer to them later if you want to, or if you want to keep, keep up with me, just that's fine too. All right? Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for this day, Lord. Fa Father, we especially give you thanks. We should do it every day, absolutely. Christmas is every day, really and truly, because your son Jesus is with us each and every day. But Father, this time of year, let us be the light shining to the world about the birth of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, this is the time of the year that we should take very, very, very serious all those who are lost. And, and really, we should do it year round, but especially this time of year, because people, everybody knows the name of Jesus. Everybody knows Jesus, is, his name but they don't know Jesus. And this is the time of year that we have a bit of a more opportunity in order to touch those lives out there because they're open to the name Jesus. So Father, be with us so that we will do that. God and direct everything for your glory, Lord. Use us as your tools, your vessels today to bring forth the word, which is Jesus Christ. Let it resonate in our hearts, build up in our very souls so that we can go out and share the beautiful, beautiful name of Jesus to all the world. 
not just today, but every day. But there's just more people today that are, that are receptive to that. It's on their minds. It's on their hearts. So let us be your messenger. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's dismiss our kids and we'll get, we'll get started. Oh, good deal. Looks like we got three or so. Well, good. Four, five, six, ten. Boy, I tell you, that's what we're looking for. That's why this uh, this uh, trail life and 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 by the way, uh, we're going to discuss a little bit more whenever we get to our business meeting today. Please join us for that if you can. You don't have to be a member of the church to find out what all we're going to talk about and uh, and and share with us your thoughts, etc. Um, but we are looking to build this church through uh, several different things that are in the works. All right, we'll talk about those at our business meeting. But as far as today, as we approach Christmas Day. Many kids are anticipating the morning of the 25th. Boy, I remember whenever we used to say, well, is Santa Claus coming? Santa Claus coming. I mean, because we were, we were poor. I mean, we didn't, we fought over a chicken leg, okay? We were poor. My mom supported five kids with three jobs. We were poor. Anyway, but we always had Christmas. You always managed somehow to get Christmas to us. And boy, the 25th, we just couldn't wait to get up and go see what was in there. I remember our scrawny little uh, silver tinsel Christmas tree with, with, with the, uh, the lights, uh, the wheel turning around with the different colors. Oh, it's green. Now it's red. Now it's blue. Strange things. But anyway, I remember the days. And that day, a lot of kids remember. But the question in their minds and in their hearts is, oh, have I been good enough that Santa Claus brought me everything I wanted? I've been really good this year, so I'm going to get that new bicycle. I'm going to get that new BB gun. I'm going to get that whatever, whatever, whatever. I, you know, because I've really been a good kid. Now, don't ask my mom, but I'm telling you, Santa Claus, I've been a good kid this year. And so I want all that stuff that's on the list. We used to go through the Sears catalog. Flip a page, circle that one, circle that one, 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 flip another page, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Well, we didn't get anything out of Sears catalog. We got it from s and Green Stamps. But that's okay. And some people are saying, what? Okay, they were gold bond too. Do you remember those? All right. Go to the s and Green Stamp store with your book. We used to get a book. Our mom would give us a book, and we would go. It was our own book, and we could go get anything we wanted that that book would buy. Huh? Well, it don't matter. But the point is, the point is, is that we looked forward to the uh, to Christmas because we could go and get what we wanted. We could go and have our dreams fulfilled. All right. <laughs> And Santa would certainly bring us anything else that we weren't able to get, right? So excited in the expectation. Sometimes it would overwhelm us because we expected great things. Great things. We weren't just going to get a bicycle. We were going to get the bicycle that we saw in the Sears catalog. I remember my first bicycle I ever got. I broke it and wrecked it on Christmas Day. But that's all right. I had a bicycle. We were going to get things, though, that would change our very lives. To, Christmas Day was going to be great. It was going to be awesome. The great gifts that we were going to get, uh, nobody else in the world was going to get those gifts but us. And our lives were going to be completely fulfilled because we were good and Santa Claus was good. And he would bring those gifts to us. And we didn't have a concept of Jesus, none whatsoever. It wasn't raised in a Christian home. It was Santa Claus, a big fat guy that dropped down through the chimney that we didn't have. <laughs> but yet he got in there somehow and he left all this stuff. Including a new pair of socks, which we thoroughly wanted because we didn't have new socks. But our lives would be changed forever. 
those new things today are Xboxes, phones. We got our grandkids list, and it's like, what? It ain't happening. A new truck? No. He's not talking about a toy truck. He's talking about a truck truck. It ain't going to happen. They're not talking about a little bitty Xbox, like a box with an X on it. They're talking about a $300 some whatever it is. Uh, maybe y'all can afford that kind of stuff, but this one can't. But see, they're, they have the wrong focus. They don't know exactly what the true meaning of Christmas is because we have commercialized it so bad that it has lost its meaning to many people and especially our children, which truly needs to be corrected. It truly does. It truly, truly does. The one thing, though, that is going to, to bring them pure ecstasy in which all other things will be meaningless they're going to get that one gift, like a new truck or a new whatever the latest phone is or the new Xbox or whatever. Then everything else is going to be okay because that's the gift. That's what I'm going to get because I've been good. Israel kind of thought the same thing. We're good. We're God's children. So we're going to get the one thing that we need. Matter of fact, God even promises us this. Let's go over to Genesis 12. Now, we're going to look at a lot of stuff, so if you can go there, fine. If not, write it down and look at it later. But I share with you exactly what God has shared with me. And in Genesis 12, God made a promise to Abraham. Who is Abraham? Well, actually, at the time, he was Abram. And he was located in southern Iraq, what is today southern Iraq. And God came to him and says, hey, I want you to go where I tell you to go. I'm not going to tell you where it is, but I want you to go there. And Abraham said, okay. And Abraham was not a worshiper of God. Abraham was a worshiper of many gods. He had many, many idols in his religion, if you want to call it that. But he heard God speak to him and says, God told him, he says, I'm going to send you where I want you to go and you shall follow. You're going to leave your family and you're going to go where I tell you to go. And Abram said, okay. And later on through in verse in chapter 12, verse one, he says, now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Now, I want you to highlight chapter, I mean, uh, verse 3 here, because we're going to come back to it uh, and again here in just a little bit. Verse 3, and I will bless those who bless you. You've all heard this, this scripture. And I will curse him who curses you. Now, look at the last part. And in you, all the families of the earth, all the families of the earth. It didn't say Israel. Matter of fact, Israel didn't even exist at this point. They were called Hebrews. They weren't Israelites until Jacob was converted by God. He says, and in, all the fa and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All the families. So right there in Genesis 12, God is telling Abram that I'm going to bless all the people of the earth. Now, he doesn't go into great detail right now, but he says, through you, through Abram, I'm going to bless all the people of the earth. Not just Israel, not just the Jews, not just the Hebrews, not just the Israelites, however you want to call them. But actually, God says this even earlier in Scripture. Go over into Genesis 1. No, I think it's Genesis 1. Let me just find it real quick. <clears throat> Actually, it's not Genesis 1. I believe it's Genesis 3. Let 
Well, where in the world? I found it this morning. <laughs> Just bear with me a second. Here, Genesis, Genesis 3 and 15. Genesis 3 and 15. And I will put enmity, enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In other words, he is telling Satan that you shall always be trying to nip at the feet of the people including Christ, in order to try to tempt them to do evil. However, Christ, Christ is going to bruise your head by crushing your head. <clears throat> in other words, what, what uh, God is telling us is that throughout time, throughout history, Satan is going to be after us, trying to tempt us in any way possible. Remember over in, uh, in Peter where he says that Satan is roaming around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour? That's the temptations of Satan. He's going to be constantly after us. But we know because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jesus overcame death, right? He, he be, overcame the wages of sin and death, which was a, a death. And so therefore, since... Sin comes from evil, and evil is of Satan. God has crushed Satan because Jesus rose again back to life. He didn't, he didn't rise back as a half-life or as a partial life. He rose back as a man alive. And we have to understand that and realize that, that God had a plan from the very, very beginning of time that there would, be, there would come someone that would defeat evil. We, and a lot of other people think, well, it's us. We do it ourselves. No, you don't. You can only do it with the power of God living in you. There's no other way to defeat the evil. There's no other way for you to overcome sin. Jesus says you can do nothing without me. There's no way you can overcome your sins without Christ living in you. There's no way possible. God announced this a blessing to Abraham, and he announced it back in, in Genesis 3. And Abram was the father of Isaac and Jacob. Jacob, as I mentioned before, became Israel. And that's where the, the country, if you will, or the nation of Israel was born, was through Jacob. In Genesis 22 and 15... Genesis 22 and 15, God's promise continues. In verse 15, it says, And then the angel of the Lord, in the Old Testament, whenever it says the angel of the Lord, and it, the angel has a capital A. It's not a small A, it's a capital A. This is Jesus. This is not Jesus as we know him as the baby being born in the manger, or being born in, in Bethlehem, if you will. This is Jesus before he became actual Jesus. He was a person. Jesus existed as a person, as God, as a person, in the third heaven before anything else was. If we read through a lot of the scriptures, it says, nothing was formed that was not formed unless it was formed by him. God spoke things into being. Jesus formed things as they are. Remember when God scooped up the dust and made Adam? He scooped up the dust of the earth. He formed a man. And he breathed into him and the man became a living being. Jesus formed that man with his own hands. Jesus existed before the beginning of anything else. But not as the Jesus we know him. Because we refer to him as the baby born in a manger or born in Bethlehem, grew up, became our Lord and our Savior at the example that we are to follow. But he existed prior to that. And there's many, many more, more scriptures that refer to that. But when you see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, that is, with a capital A, that is Jesus. All right? Then the angel of the Lord called to Abram the second time out of the heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, 
Blessings, I will bless you and multiply. I will multiply your descendants as the stars in the heaven, the sands of the seashore. All right, now look at this last part. And your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. There again, through your seed, all the nations, that means all the people of the earth, shall be blessed through that seed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to this young man and they rose and went to the uh, to Beersheba and Abraham dwelt in at Beersheba. Now, this is a story of Isaac. This is a story which is a depiction of Christ being crucified for us. Uh, first, God tested Abraham because he had changed his name to Abraham. He tested Abraham by saying, you are going to take Isaac and you're going to go up to the mountain and you're going to sacrifice him to me. But wait a minute, over in chapter 15 of Genesis, you told me that you were going to bless me through my son Isaac. So how am I going to kill him and be blessed? If I kill him, how am I going to be blessed through him? You see, we don't understand the minds of God. We don't comprehend God's thinking. We don't comprehend God's ways. That's why we have to live by faith and not by sight. We have to trust God in anything and everything. And Abraham trusted God because Abraham was about to kill Isaac. His knife was here. He was about to plunge it into his son, his only son, and kill him. And God, the angel of the Lord, stopped him. He said, no, use the ram that's caught over there in the bushes. That's going to be the sacrifice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know the story. But what the Jews seem to forget is, is let's go back up here to 18, or 17. It says, your descendants, Abraham's descendants, those are the, that's where the Jewish nation came from. Your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. Which is telling them, they're going to be the rulers. They're going to be the rulers of the world. Because there, anybody who is not of Abraham was their enemies. It's the same way that Jesus says, if you're not with me, you're, you're against me. Uh, we talked about this several times. Oh, we're studying the book of Romans. In Romans 5.10, it says, we were born enemies of God. If we're not children of God, we're not just unfriends of God, if you will. Is that way? Unfriends? That's not right. We're just not, um, we're just not, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Acquaintances, Acquaintances of God. Eh, not really, but. Basically, what it's saying is, is that we don't know God. We know of God, but we don't know God. But in 510, it says that we're actually enemies of God. If we're not children of God, if you're not a child of God, you are an enemy of God. Why did God destroy all the nations that he destroyed back over in the Old Testament? It's because they were enemies of God. Why is he going to destroy all those who don't believe? Because they're enemies of God. So... If you're not a child of God, according to the scriptures, you're an enemy of God. Well, it's the same way with what the, the uh, Israelites thought or the Hebrews thought or the descendants of Abraham. They thought, well, if they're not descendants of Abraham, then they got to be enemies. It's just that simple. And we're going to possess their gates. So in other words, all those who are not of Abraham, we're going to rule over them. Because we've got the seed that's going to come and going to give us their gates. In other words, he's going to conquer the whole world. And we get to be the rulers. This is their thinking. That's why they are looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. Because they get to be the big cheese. Finally. Now. Prior to this, it hasn't been real good for them. There were many, many, many nations who ruled over them. Many nations who ruled over them. But they knew that at some particular time, they were going to be rulers of the world. How many times have we seen science fiction movies and all that where, yes, I'm going to be the ruler of the world. I shall overtake the world. Nobody's going to overtake this world, not even Satan, because God is King of kings and Lord of lords. The man Jesus that we know is King of kings and Lord of lords, and no one is more powerful than he. But in this period of time, 
This means anyone who was not of the Hebrews or later the Israelites were enemies and the Israelites were going to rule over them. <clears throat> and this is what stuck in their minds. We're going to get the big gift. The big gift is coming. The big gift is not the Messiah. The big gift is that we get to be the big cheese. We get to be the rulers of everything. Because they hadn't had a, a great history. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. So the excitement in the, in, in, of Israel, God's children, is kind of like the children at Christmas. You know, the children at Christmas morning. I'm getting something that will change my life. Oh, what a glorious day that shall be. But they look, the kids today, they look at it like an Xbox. How long does an Xbox last? Now, let me just ask you this, and those of you, you probably know this today. Your phone, everybody's got a cell phone, right? How soon does your cell phone become outdated? Usually the next day. It's the same way with a computer. Oh, I'm going to get this nice new computer. Tomorrow it's outdated. Everything is temporary. Everything in this world is temporal. It does not last. But the greatest gift that we can receive will last for eternity and does last for eternity. Do children's all, do children on Christmas morning always get everything that they expect they're going to get? Not at all. We can't afford it. I can't afford a new truck for me, much less for my grandkids. Because when it does, when it comes right down to it, they don't really even know what's best for them. And see, I got a 14-year-old grandson who wants a new truck. He didn't have a driver's license yet. Now, he's been driving since he was four when he was sitting in my lap, and he's a good driver. I let him drive. Shh. I let him drive on the roads, certain roads. And he's a good driver. And he, and he does very, very well. But he, he's not even old enough to get a learner's permit yet. So do you think I'm going to buy him a new truck and let it sit in my yard for two years? It ain't happening. Because he's certainly not going to drive it home. Israel expected the same thing. They expected to rule the world. Instead, they were conquered over and over and over again. Egypt conquered them. Assyria conquered them. Babylon conquered them. Conquered them. Medo Persia, Greece, and then finally Rome during Christ's time had conquered them. And they're sitting back thinking, yeah, but when the Messiah comes, we're going to conquer everybody. He is, and we're going to rule the world. But yet, year after year, generation after generation after generation after generation, another country, another nation came and conquered them. And at this time, they were under Roman rule. Israel didn't actually get their freedom. I believe it was 1947, 48, 1948. This is my history man right here, let me tell you. But 1948 is whenever Israel, 1948, not a thousand years ago when Christ walked the earth or 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago. When 1948 is when they received their freedom. Boy, did they miss the mark? Yeah, they did. But God had made a promise that they, that they believed and they expected the Messiah would come and he would, he would conquer everybody and let them be the rulers. Blinded by the thinking of Israel, for they wanted a warrior king to defeat all their enemies. Messiah, it means the anointed one, or in Greek, the Christ. That is the word for, in Greek, now, say, well, why do we need to know Greek, etc.? Right before the Romans overthrew Israel, they were under the rule of Greece. And the vast majority of the people during Christ's time spoke Greek. And so, they used Greek all the time. So when somebody said the Christ, they knew that they were talking about the, the uh, Messiah, the anointed one, because that in Greek is uh, Christ. We call it Jesus Christ. That's not Jesus' last name. The best way to actually say it is 
Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Messiah. Jesus the Anointed One. That is a much better way to describe it than Jesus Christ. However, Scripture calls him Jesus Christ. Paul calls him Christ Jesus, etc., etc. So either way it goes. But always as, as Rock and Country Church, you need to learn that the best way to understand it and the, really the best way to phrase Jesus is Jesus the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Savior. Okay? So please remember that. When you're talking to somebody this next week, or next couple of weeks, about Jesus' birth, etc. It is Jesus the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Savior. All right? The Chosen One promised by God, who would sit on the throne of David and rule forever. That's over in 2 Samuel 7, 12, and 13. He would come. The Christ will crush the head of of all evil that existed, as was prophesied over in Genesis 3 and 15. And since Israel was God's cho chosen children, certainly the Messiah would crush all the enemies of Israel. Genesis 12 and 3. Remember whenever, when we saw that? Genesis 12 and 3. You don't have to turn back there, but it says... And I told you to highlight 12 and 3. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. So Israel in their mind is thinking, when the Messiah comes, all these people have been against us. He's going to wipe them out. But they forget the little part that says, and in, all, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So that doesn't mean he's going to wipe out the whole earth. It doesn't mean he's going to wipe out all of of Israel, it means that he is going to be here for all of Israel and all of the earth. But what uh, Israel did not remember is that in 12 and 3. So that's why I want you to highlight that, underline it, etc., just so that you will remember that. Just like a child at Christmas, they are not interested in the gifts of others, of their brothers and sisters, and what they will get. They're only interested in what, they, what the child will get. You ever, you, who's got brothers and sisters? Most all of us do. Okay, so when your brothers and sisters and you ran downstairs, if you will, to see what Santa brought you, how many of your brothers and sisters says, oh, well, here, look, let's see what you got. I'm more interested in what you got. I want to see it here. Open your presents. No, they said, get out of my way. And they tore into theirs. Oh, well, this one can't be mine. It's a doll. That's got to be one of my sisters. They throw it aside and tear into something else. No, as kids, as children, we're only interested in what we're going to get. Well, that's exactly what Israel was doing. They were only interested in what they were. They forget the second part of 12 and 3 there, where it says, and through you, the, the whole world will be blessed. What a prophecy. Wouldn't you like to be a blessing to the world? As a as a true Christian, I hope that is your goal, is to be a blessing to the world. You're, you're not here. You're not here to be the blessing of everybody. You're here to be a blessing to everybody. See, and we have a tendency to forget that sometimes. Oh, well, it's all about me, isn't it? Not at all. It's all about Jesus is who it's about. And what Jesus has done for me. And I want to share that with you. Because what he's done for me, and I don't know why he would do it, but what he's done for me, he'll do for you. See, that's how you bless others. You continue the work of Christ. Blessing others with what Christ has done for you. Irregardless of, of people and what they think should be, God has a plan he has a plan for your life. He has a plan for my life. You probably know this scripture, and I love this scripture, but in Jeremiah 29, 11, God's word says, for I know the plans I have for you. For you. Put your name there. I know the plans I have for you. Declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and to not harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. 
That's what God has planned for you. That's what God has planned for Israel. That's what God has planned for everybody who comes to him and believes. The Messiah, the Savior, the Christ is coming for all people. But we're blessed through the, the, the um, nation of Israel because Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was born of the tribe of Judah. He was a descendant of Jacob. He was a descendant of David. He was a descendant of Abraham. He was a descendant of, of Adam himself. Jesus the man was born of a virgin by the Holy Spirit of God. Many times, and we're going to look at this in just a little bit, Jesus referred to him as son of man throughout the New Testament. Many times. He only, I think it's only three times he re referred to himself as son of God. The rest of the time he referred to himself as son of man. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. But Jeremiah 29, 11, which I just gave you, for you know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, to prosper you and to not harm you and to give you a hope in the future, is also in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 6. That you ought to write down. 1 Peter 1. We're not going to go there, but 1 Peter 1, 3 through 6. This hope, this hope, which was prophesied throughout the Old Testament and promised to not only Israel, but to all the families of the earth, has a name. This hope has a name. And it is a name above all names. Let's go to Philippians. I do want you to go there, if you will. Philippians 2. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, being the, speaking of Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and the coming in the likeness of men. In other words, God became a man. Where have you heard that before? We're well, going to hear it several times in the next couple of, of uh, Sundays. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God also was highly, who has highly exalted him and given him the name above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, and to those in heaven and to those on the earth and to those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus the Christ is the Lord of all the earth to the glory of God the Father. This is prophesied in the Old Testament and it comes to fruition, if you will, here. Shows us here in Philippians. The Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah... In Luke 1 and 3, it says, And behold, you will conceive in your, in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. You shall call his name Jesus. That's in uh, Luke 1, 31. God of salvation or Savior. Again, it's prophesied over and over and over that the Messiah would come and that Messiah's name is Jesus. In Isaiah 7 and 14, we're told of his birth. In Isaiah, back to the Old Testament. This is why I said you don't have to flip back and forth if you don't want to, but, <laughs> but, but write down, write them down. Isaiah, in Isaiah, some call it Isaiah, some call it Isaiah. Isaiah 7, starting at verse 11. Ask a sign for yourself for the Lord to, your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. In other words, what uh, Ahaz is, is being told here is he says, you ask anything, anything at all. But Isaiah, I, I has... Ahaz is how you pronounce it. Ahaz, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Isaiah said, Hear now, O Israel of David. 
It is a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and he shall be called, his name shall be Emmanuel, which means God with us. I mean, over and over and over it is prophesied that this man Jesus is going to be born and is going to come, and this is the Christ, the anointed one, the, the child of God, the seed of Abraham, the virgin birth, on and on and on. All through the Old Testament is prophesied over and over and over. And in Isaiah 9, which should be, if you're there, uh, Isaiah 9 and 2, it says, And the people will be walk, who walk in dark, darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light has shined. In other words, there again, the light of the world, which is Jesus, is given unto them in order to show the darkness that we walk in, if you will, or to bring us out of the darkness. If you go over into John 1, Jesus is the light. He is the light of mankind. He is, and we're called to be the light of the world because we have Jesus living in us. And in Romans and in uh, many other scriptures, it talks about how men will not come into the light because they, they fear that the truth will be known about their sins. Because the truth, Jesus is the way, the truth, and life, and the truth will be shown. We will understand where we mess up. But that's not to condemn us. It is only to convict us so that we will change our ways and come into the light and learn more and more and more about the coming of the Messiah, the Savior. Then Israel is comforted and encouraged. We're not going to go there because it's uh, 26 books or 26 chapters, but... Mark down Isaiah 40 through Isaiah 66. Isaiah 40 through 66. There's 26 chapters there of the blessings that are going to come to Israel. 26 chapters of the blessings that are going to come to Israel. They're going to be redeemed. Israel is going to be redeemed. These are prophecies of the Messiah, the Savior, coming to the land of Israel, coming to the nation of Israel. And it further tells us that, the, that Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, is going to come to save us as well. He is going to be the Savior of the Gentiles. You see, we don't have denominations in, in God's church. God's church, you know the church is, is, is not the denomination of Baptists or this denomination or that denomination it is the believers in Jesus Christ right I hope everybody understands that if you don't I'll be happy to explain that so we need to realize that God has brought the both Jew and Gentile into one so he has created one church so a lot of us say oh well I wouldn't want to be the Jews well, if God has created Jew and Gentile to be one, you consider yourself as a Jew. Which simply means you considered yourself as a, as a receiver of the promised Messiah. You're not of the Jewish faith, but you are of Christ. And the Jews that are of Christ will be saved. The Jews that do not believe in, in Jesus Christ, according to the scriptures, will not be saved. We talked about this in Wednesday night in our Bible study. You must believe God's promises are true and receive those promises that have been foretold since the beginning of time. This is not something new. Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament is prophesied over and over and over that we need a Savior. The world needs a Savior. And there's only one. That's the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Christ. And He will, redeemed all who, will redeem all those who believe. In Isaiah 43, I do want to go there. 
Isaiah 43. See, it takes me a little bit to get to it, too. Isaiah 43, starting at verse 10. You are my witness. Well, I love that. I want to be the witness of Christ. Says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed. There shall be, there shall there be, nor shall there be after me. I, even I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed and there is no foreign God among you. There are no other gods. We talked a little bit about uh, over in the uh, book of Corinthians where Paul was talking about eating things offered to idols and gods, etc. I love where Paul just simply says, I eat whatever I want to because there are no other gods. You can say all day long that, you know, you sacrifice this to a God or whatever, but there are no other gods. So what does, it has no effect. It, it means nothing to me. Because there's only one God. Therefore you are my witness, says the Lord, that I am God. Indeed, before the day was, I am he. And there was no one who can deliver out of my hand. <clears throat> I work and will reverse it. There's absolutely no one that can, can take us out of the hand of God. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel... For your sake, I will send Babylon and bring them all down to fugitives and the Chaldeans who rejoice in their ships. I am the Lord, the Holy One, the creator of Israel, your king. This is for all, the whole world. This is not just for the, the Israelites or just for the Jews. This is for the entire world. Because this is, the Messiah was given for all of us. In uh, chapter 45... Isaiah 45, verses 15 through 19. Truly you are God who hide yourself. O God of Israel, the Savior, they shall be ashamed and also disgraced, all of them. They shall go down in confusion together who are makers of idols. But Israel shall be saved by the Lord with the everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed or disgraced forever and ever. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and who made it. In other words, he said, he, he's telling us, who else, who else is God but him? Who has established it? Who did not create it in vain? Who formed it to be inhabited? I am the Lord and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret in the dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, there it is again, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Verse 25, he says, he shall say, surely the, in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. To him men shall come and all shall be ashamed who are incensed against him who do not believe. In the Lord, all the descendants of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. In other words, all the descendants of Israel. Well, who are the descendants of, uh, of Israel? As we understand, there is but one body of Christ. Then we are descendants of Israel as well. Do we understand that? We are adopted into the family of God. We are adopted into the family of Israel. We're not, we don't follow the Jewish faith, but there are Judean, what they call Judean Christians who believe in Jesus Christ. Those are Jews, professing Jews that believe in Jesus Christ. We are their brothers and sisters and they are our brothers and sisters and we have one God and that it, one God is God. And through that one God, the seed came, which was Jesus, 
for the land of Israel and for the Gentiles. It is prophesied through scripture over and over and over. <coughs> In chapter 23, you don't, don't need to go there, but it tells us that there was nothing special about him that would draw us to him. But the promised Savior would take upon himself the sins of the world. The sins of the world. Not just the Jewish sins. Not just the Gentile sins. The sins of the world. Remember we're over in uh, uh, 3 and 15 where it says, or uh, 12, and, 12 and 3. Where it says, and the earth will be blessed. The earth will be blessed. Well, this, this is for you and me. The whole world is going to be blessed through Jesus Christ. There was nothing about him that would attract us to him. In other words, he's as plain as I am. There's, there's absolutely nothing that, that would set him off from any other person. Except that he had the glory of God on him. And through him. He would take all the sins of, his, of the world, of the entire world. And by his stripes we are healed. Healed not from sickness and death, but healed from the wages of sin, which is the eternal death. That is the healing that we are promised. We have, I hate to say it, but it is what it is. We have gone through a few funerals here lately. We've, got, we've lost some of our loved ones here lately. Many of you have lost loved ones in your life. God didn't say that we wouldn't die a physical death. But we are healed from the wages of sin, which is the eternal death. We know through the reading of scriptures and through the understanding of scriptures that we're going to receive the eternal life that is provided through the blood of Jesus Christ. And it comes from no other point, no other way, no other man, no other God, because there is no other God. There is only Jesus. Jesus. And this is for Jew and Gentile. Or, if you will, this is for his church. This is the importance of being a part of the church. You can be religious all day long. You can do the Christian thing all day long. But if you're not a member of the church, you're not a, a, a partaker in the gift. You will not receive eternal life. We talked about this last week. Jesus says over in John 3 and 7, you must be born again. You have to be born again. This is the importance of understanding what Scripture says. The, the, the promised Messiah was to come. The promised Messiah came. The promised Messiah is prophesied to come again. The promised Messiah will come. Jesus is the only Savior. In Daniel 7 and 13 and 14, I'm going to go there. You don't have to go there if you don't want to. But Daniel 7, and I, I had that one marked. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I was watching in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds from heaven. Does that sound familiar? Those of you who have done Bible study, you know exactly what he's talking about, right? This is the rapture. This is the rapture of the church. This is when the Son of Man comes back in the clouds and takes his church to be with him. This is Old Testament prophecy, not New Testament. It says, I was watching in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him then it to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and language should serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion this sounds just like where it said over in first samuel where the throne of david would last forever and ever and ever and he would be sitting on the throne which shall not pass away in his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed this is the coming back of the Messiah. This is the coming back of Jesus. This is the coming back during the millennial time when Jesus is coming back to rule the earth for a thousand years. And then right after that, he will rule eternity forever. 
This is all prophesied in, in, in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation. But it's also prophesied in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The, the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. You must know the entire the Bible. Not just parts of it. Not just, oh, well, yeah, I know a little bit about it. No, you got to know more and more and more and more. And truly, if you, and number 11 is a good example of that. He, said, he told me the other day, he says, I got to studying, and I end up studying for four and a half hours. Once you get hooked on Jesus, you can't get enough. I mean, sometimes you have to stop because you got to sleep, but you just can't get enough. Because it's good news. We like hearing good news, right? We got enough bad news in our world. We love hearing good news. Well, the good news is Jesus. And it's for you and it's for me. Jesus here is referred to over in Daniel 7, 13 and 14. It's the first time he's referred to as the Son of Man in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, he refers to himself many, many times as the Son of Man. Why does he do that? Showing us that as a man, the example for us to follow that we could live as he lived. Now, I know everybody's saying, well, I still mess up. We could live as he lives. See, we're, we're in the works. Philippians 1, uh, uh, 1, 6 tells us that he will complete what he starts in us. That means we got a long road. Each, each and every day, each and every day, we have to progress in, in our likeness of Christ. Living as he lived this, we failed. Therefore, Israel needs a redeemer, and we also need a redeemer, redeemer and that redeemer is Jesus, which God promised in the birth of a baby. He promised this in the birth of a baby. That's not what we want. We want a warrior king. We want somebody to come back and destroy our enemies, right? Well, see, we lose sight of who our enemies are. I'm not, don't raise your hand on this, but do you know who your enemy is? It is Satan. And it is the sin that lives in you because that's what displeases God. That's what separates us from God is the sin that lives in us. It's not your neighbor that you don't like. It's not your ex-mother-in-law or father-in-law. It's not your brother, your sister, your cousin. It's not even Russia. It's not Iraq. It's not Afghanistan. Our enemy is Satan. And by him, the sin dwells in us. But Jesus has overcome sin. He took that sin upon himself. He became, a lot of people don't understand this. I think y'all do because we've discussed it before. Jesus became sin. Not just taking your sins. He became sin. And he took that sin and he buried it in the grave. And as a man, he rose again, leaving sin in the grave. So it has been overcome. So whatever he has overcome, which is all sin, you and I can overcome. We have the same power, according to the book of Romans. We have, I believe it's Romans 6. We have the same power living in us. No, it's not. It's Romans 1. We have the same power living in us that rose Jesus from the grave. We have that resurrection power. We can resurrect, we can resurrect from living in sin to living without a sin. Oh, well, I just can't quit doing whatever it is I'm doing. Sure you can. You stop. That's how you quit doing it. You just quit doing it. We used this in Wednesday night. Used to smoke, run this horse to the death. But anyway, how do you quit smoking? You don't buy cigarettes. That's it. I'm not saying smoking is a sin. But what I'm saying is because you don't go to hell for smoking a cigarette. All right. All right, just because you smoke, just because you take a drink, whatever, whatever, doesn't mean you're condemned to hell, okay? There's one thing that will condemn you to hell, and that's not believing in Christ. There's one thing that will get you into hell, and that's believing in Christ. It's just that simple. So the point is, is that whatever God puts on your heart, James 4, 17, uh, whatever God puts on your heart to not sin, to not do, if you continue doing it, it is a sin, because God has told you not to do it. But how do you quit smoking? You quit smoking. That's how you quit. 
You put them down, you don't buy them, you don't get them, and you quit. Pretty simple. But Satan says, oh, but it tastes so good. Now, a smoker understands that. Non-smoker don't understand that. Non-smoker goes, phew, wee, my gosh, that stuff's nasty. But a smoker understands that. But if God is telling you to quit lying, then quit lying. If he tells you to quit running around, quit running around. If he tells you to quit uh, drinking, quit drinking. That's between you and God. I'm not your judge and neither is any other person. But God is your judge. And if he puts it on your heart to stop doing something, it is for his pleasure, not yours. And God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So he's right there to help you all the way. And believe me, firsthand knowledge, he can make it happen. When I quit that night drinking in 1989, I didn't take any sense. When I quit smoking uh, eight years ago or whatever it was, I haven't smoked since. Not saying that that was sin to me because God said for me to quit, not you, all right? I hope we understand that. I'm not judging anybody. We must understand God provided a baby and not a warrior. But that baby grew to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the defeater of all sin, a mighty, mighty warrior that simply defeats evil with the words of his mouth. That's it. Just speak in the word. That's all he does. That's all he has to do. When he comes back on his horse in Revelation, it's either 19 or 20. When he comes back on his horse and we come back with him, it says, Scripture says, there is a sword that comes out of his mouth to defeat all the armies of the Battle of Armageddon. What is that sword that comes out of his mouth? Scripture clearly tells us the sword is the word of God. So he simply speaks defeat over all things that come against him. When he was tempted in the, in the um, wilderness by Satan himself, how did he defeat Satan? He spoke the word of God. How did God create the world? It tells us over in Genesis 1. He spoke it into existence. The power of the word, the power of God's word, the sword of the spirit can slice through anything and everything that comes against you. You have to stand on the word. And the word says that the Messiah is here. And he came as a baby. In uh, Luke 2, 11, it says today, in this paraphrase, today in the city of David, a child is born, a savior who is Christ the Lord. Who is Christ the Lord? This is what we should be excited about, especially this time of year. Why? Because we are fighting all the commercialism that is out there. We should be excited not about the, the garland and the, and the ornaments and the gifts and all this kind of stuff. We should be excited about the gift, which is the Christ that was given for you and me and given to you and me. Because he is still alive today. He is not dead. He rose up out of the grave alive. He defeated death. And our world out there that we had encountered day in and day out is saying, oh, what are you going to get for Christmas? What are you going to get your kids for Christmas? What are you going to get your wife for Christmas? Now, I bought my wife some, some uh, I thought it was nice Christmas gifts, some Reese's, candy uh, Reese's peanut butter cups, and no. <laughs> No, I didn't. I didn't. I know y'all don't like that, but no, I didn't win her. But I did buy her a couple of gifts, and she's already got them, and she likes them, and she's happy with them. But that's not what it's about. Each year we tell each other, and we truly mean it. You don't have to get anything, but this is what she did need. And one thing, I wanted to get her. I bought it down in Mexico. And I wanted to get it for her because I love her. And I wanted to give her a gift. But she and I know that this season is not about just getting gifts. This season is really about the gift. The gift. The material things that we get are great, but they're temporary. 
that necklace and earrings that I got her, she's probably going to lose one if she hadn't already. She's notorious for losing earrings. She's got one of every earring. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but the things that we get are temporary. They're not going to last. Whereas Jesus, our Savior, is eternal. He is eternal. This is the gift. This is the gift of the season. This is the gift to the Jews. And they rejected him. Don't reject him. Because only through him will you ever see the kingdom of God or enter the kingdom of God. We studied that last week, or the week before, in John, um, in, uh, John 3. The greatest gift ever given was and is the Christ child given by God to all who will receive and in this we rejoice this is the reason for the season the Christ child when we say the baby was born in a manger that's a misstatement the manger is a feed trough we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. The gift of God that is given for me and you that we celebrate, that we celebrate this, this time of year, which we should celebrate it every day. The gift is the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, God the Savior, Emmanuel. God with us. May God be with you. And you go out and share Christmas, more Christ, with someone this season. Amen? Let's pray. Let's pray. Father God, if anybody does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior today, I pray, Lord, that you will touch their hearts, open up their minds, souls, and spirits to receive Jesus. This is the reason for the season, the birth of our Savior. The coming of the Christ, the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world, Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you will instill in people's hearts and souls the desire to seek out a Savior. To save them from the evils of the world. Because Lord knows we've got a lot of evil in our world. And there's only one Savior. It is the Christ. It is Jesus. For only God saves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. If anybody needs prayer for anything, please come forward and let us pray for you or with you. <coughs> and uh, I hope you enjoyed the message. I know it's a lot of scriptures and stuff. But the point is, is that... Even the Jews who denied Christ and still deny him, many still deny him today, if they too shall come to Christ and receive him as Lord and Savior, then they too shall be saved. That's what the word says. So we need to understand that there is no way to heaven. This is what John, uh, John told us over in chapter 3. You cannot see the kingdom of God and you certainly cannot enter the kingdom of God unless it is through the Messiah. Jesus Christ. And this is who we celebrate the birth of this month. Amen? Amen. Amen. So if anybody needs prayer, let us pray with you.